Welcome to IFAB Online. Welcome to IFAB Online. Welcome to IFAB Online. Hello, everyone. Welcome to IFAB Online. I'm Sean O'Hara, your moderator today for a session on fundraising in Asia for North America. I have two esteemed colleagues with me today, Jesse Brooks, who's the Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Spillman College. Jesse brings nearly 20 years of higher ed fundraising to us today. He comes from not only Spillman College, but he has a background at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California at San Diego, and as the head of corporate and foundation relations at Thunderbird School of Global Management. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I'm happy to be here today. Um, as Sean mentioned, I am the Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Spelman College. Um, I've been uh, in that position for the past four years, and it's definitely been an, ex an exciting four years for me. I want to give you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about my background uh, as well. Uh, so prior to when I first started out in my fundraising career, I started out working for the Thunderbird, the International Graduate School in Phoenix, Arizona. And I started there working in corporate relations and that's when I started my career. After that, my stint at Thunderbird, I moved to Seattle at the University of Washington where I became a frontline fundraiser but also worked for corporate relations for the College of Engineering uh, at the University of Washington. After that, I left Seattle, moved to San Diego where I spent the next 15 years and I spent seven years at the University of California, San Diego, doing frontline fundraising for biological sciences, but also, and also Scripps Institution of Oceanography, one of the world's leading research institutions for oceanography. Then I went to the Crosstown Rival, San Diego State, and I spent eight years there where I worked uh, for uh, doing frontline fundraising for health and human services, sciences, and eventually I was promoted to be the Associate Vice President for Development working on the successful San Diego State campaign. And now uh, I'm at Spelman College. And I wanted to take this time to just give you a, a brief overview of Spelman College because many of you may not know about Spelman College. So I'd like to do that at this point in time. So I'm gonna transition to the slides. I want to tell you a little bit about Spelman College. Um, it was founded in 1881 by two Baptist missionaries in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta certainly is an, a town that is storied in a lot of civil rights activism and a lot of history uh, in, for the US. Uh, it's all female and are, we educate African-American women. It is a, a liberal arts, a very highly respected liberal arts college. Um, we have 2,200 young women who are part of our student body, um, freshmen through seniors. We do not have graduate programs at Spelman. It's strictly undergraduate. And we're a member of the Atlanta University Consortium. And so what that means is we're in a consortium with three other institutions uh, in Atlanta that are co-located. Morehouse College, which is all, male, all males, Clark Atlanta, which is co-ed, actually females and males, and then the Morehouse School of Medicine, which is um, a, a fine, fine academic institution. I want, to, I want to talk about some pride points at Spelman College because we're one of the highest, uh, we have a very strong program in liberal arts and we have over 27 majors in liberal arts, but, and we are the number one historically black college university in the country. There are approximately a hundred uh, historically black colleges and universities. We were number one, we've been number one for 14 consecutive years. Uh, we're number 50, 54 for best liberal arts colleges uh, as ranked by US News and World Report. We're number 32 for study abroad in terms of when you look at the number of students that we send abroad, we're number 32 in study abroad and that's been a, a, a strong focus for the institution. We're number one, we're the number one producer of black women who can complete PhDs in science, technology, engineering and mathematics in the country. And I just want to conclude by saying um, also 48% of our students are Pell eligible, which means that many of our students have significant need. And that's a high number for Pell eligible students, but we're able to, we're able to uh, accept these students and make sure that they get a high quality education. We have a six year graduation rate of, at 75%. 
Um, and in terms of if you're looking at the African American community, that's 30 points higher than at any other institution in the country for African American graduates. And our students hail from 40 state and countries. So I just wanted to give you just a quick overview of Spelman College to, to let you know uh, our excellence. Super, thank you, Jesse. Our other esteemed colleague is Liza Bofin Yordanoff. Liza leads the Nanyang Technical University's de development team as the chief development officer and executive director of the development office. Um, Liza joined NTU in September 2018 from the Indian Institute of Technology at Bombay, IITB, where she was the first chief development officer and CEO of the IITB Development and Relations Foundation in Mumbai. She was also the vice president of advancement at Franklin University in Switzerland, senior director of international advancement at George Washington University, and Director of Development at Singh Health and Dean of Undergraduate Programs at the Center for American Education in Singapore. Uh, Liza has um, a proud resume having brought the um, Certified Fundraising Executive Credential in Singapore as the first to be trained in Singapore. And she's an AFP Master Teacher and taught at the Annual Giving Module for the AFP Essentials Certificate Program. It's, it's nice to have you with us, Liza, welcome. Thanks so much, Sean. I am so pleased to be here with everybody. Uh, so like Jesse, um, I'd love to share some more about how I came to be here in Singapore. Uh, this is actually my second time around in Singapore. I first came in 2007. But like most of the folks who I think are joining me, uh, I started my alma mater. So I'm getting ready to head into my 23rd year uh, in university advancement. But I started at my alma mater, uh, Trinity Washington University, uh, a women's, all women's university <laughs> in Washington, DC, home of Nancy Pelosi, uh, quite proud tradition. Um, and I was there for five years, starting in alumni relations, became director of the annual fund and finished out my tenure there as director of a capital campaign, which was a $15 million campaign, which at the time was huge. <laughs> I think, you know, on a campaign that early in my career uh, really gave me some perspective um, because I find myself now planning a billion dollar campaign. So working through a $15 million campaign, we came at at 18.5 for the first building on our campus, uh, the largest uh, sports complex for women and girls on the East Coast of the US. So quite a, a, an exciting opportunity. And then I joined the, uh, the <laughs> campaign team at Purdue University. So Purdue was in its first billion dollar campaign. I came in reporting to two different deans. So um, using the, the five years experience that I've had uh, at Trinity, starting uh, alumni chapters, um, you know, we, I started four international chapters. Uh, I reported to the, the dean for international programs and the dean for the graduate college. And uh, what was exciting about that position is um, having two heads, <laughs> having two different direct reports, can be challenging and it's something that I think when when people read the job description they had a lot of questions and concerns but it actually gave me a lot of experience in reporting to two different two very different uh, academics and two very different uh, teams uh, so from Purdue uh, you know I was really uh, lucky uh, we finished the, the the campaign the billion dollar campaign we came in over goal which I think anytime you work on a campaign you always shoot to, to you always hope to overshoot um, and I was essentially headhunted to join the National University of Singapore. So I was one of the first 10 members to join the, uh, the team at NUS. Uh, so I came to Singapore first in 2007 um, and started the annual giving team. Uh, it was a great opportunity to really grow a young team and taking that experience of um, having started in alumni relations, working in annual giving, and then running a small team at Purdue in campaign coming out to a new country where philanthropy, you know, uh, Singaporeans and Asians in general are very philanthropic. I think trying to find out um, what's the story, what's the catch that's going to make them, uh, what's the story that's going to resonate most with them. Uh, so I was at NUS for uh, three years. I moved on to, um, <laughs> to be dean for a university program here uh, in Singapore um, and then moved into healthcare. Um, which was um, a contract position, which I think, you know, so many of us who, are, who work in university administration, uh, you know, have kind of a, 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 thing, a, a mindset that, hey, it can't be that difficult to, to transition this experience that I have in, 
in university administration because we've all worked with professors. Medical doctors can't be that much different. <laughs> and I know there are some folks who are shaking their heads. Yeah, they're, they're, they're real different. And it's at that point that I decided to leave Singapore and uh, move back to the States and, and took a position with George Washington University um, directing their um, alumni and uh, development program internationally. So um, traveling about 240 days a year, um, crazy, crazy travel schedule, um, and working with the new president. So really getting some great uh, exposure internationally. Um, and that's when I, I decided to take my career international again <laughs> and joined a really small college uh, in uh, Lugano, Switzerland. Uh, great experience. I think those of us who um, come from large teams, uh, come from large universities, again, sometimes have that trepidation of making that shift uh, to running your own team uh, at a small place. Uh, it was a great experience for me, and it set me up to be successful when I joined IIT Bombay. So, you know, coming to India after having traveled to India many, many times, <laughs> I think, again, we all, you know, have that, I, I've been to Honolulu on vacation. I thought that'd be a great place to live. I had that same feeling about Mumbai. Mumbai, I've been there. I love that city. I could totally live there. Um, it, it's, it's a different experience when you, uh, when you pick up and move uh, to a new country, uh, a new culture, um, and a new academic framework. So uh, universities in India are very British, <laughs> very conservative, uh, and very by the book. So, you know, setting up a new, uh, a new foundation was actually much more difficult than I anticipated or even that the academic leadership anticipated. Um, so after two years at IIT Bombay, I was really lucky to uh, be headhunted and join um, President Subra Suresh, who is our new president, well, not new anymore, uh, but our new president at NTU. Um, and I've been here sliding into my third year, which I just can't believe. So let me share a little bit about NTU. Um, it is a national university in Singapore. Um, so very similar to what we would consider a land grant university uh, in the US. So we were established in 1991. We are an, a research intensive public university. Uh, we are funded <laughs> by a vast, vast, uh, uh, most of our expenses are funded by the Singapore government and the Singapore people, the taxpayers of Singapore. Uh, we have 33,000 undergrads and postgrads in six different colleges and 11 schools. Uh, we have 250,000 living alumni. So we, while we are young, uh, we count on the tradition of two previous institutions that came before NTU, uh, and those are counted in our alumni numbers. So um, we graduate a very significant cohort of students every year, and we will hit 265,000 living alumni this year. We're ranked 13th globally. Uh, in the QS uh, world rankings. Uh, again, this is something that we were, we were thrilled again to, uh, to beat our ranking from last year. We continue to be the world's best young university. This is the seventh consecutive year that we've held that title with QS. Um, and we have a lot of international students on campus. So we have over 100 nationalities on campus and 300 global academic partners. So we're lucky to have a very diverse student body, but also a very diverse academic body. So our faculty and staff um, also come from over 100 different uh, countries of nationality. So just to give you a, a flavor of why NTU is NTU, we are a technological university. Um, we are ranked eighth in the world for Triple E, electronic and electronic engineering. This is the largest engineering school in the world. So I'm really lucky to work with some amazing faculty members who really love teaching undergrads but really get into the research that's around um, making world issues, uh, particularly those surrounding the, the fourth industrial revolution, making solutions um, and turning those into real world opportunities. Um, again, that, that leads into the second point on this slide is we top Asian universities in normalized research citation impact. Again, this is a crucial indication of the depth of research that's happening at NTU. And <laughs> just so you don't think we're just nerds, we're also dorks. So uh, <laughs> our business school MBA uh, rated top in Singapore uh, since 2004 by The Economist. So we have a really diverse campus. Um, 
that is just a fantastic hotbed for innovation um, and entrepreneurship. Thanks a lot, Liza. Well, as you can see, we bring a, a wealth of fundraising experience um, across a wide diversity of institutions um, around the world having Jesse and Liza with us today. So let's have a, a quick conversation about fundraising in Asia for North America. So Jesse, tell us first a little bit about, about your region being the United States and, and how a foreigner should consider addressing the opportunities and challenges of, of, of raising money in North America. I think how a foreigner should, should approach raising money certainly in, in the US and keep in mind that I've been in various regions. I've worked on the West Coast, and now I'm actually working in, in the Southeast, which is very different you know, than the West Coast. I would say that what's important is you need to, it's important to get to know the region and the area, the culture, what resonates, what motivates people, what's actually happening in that community. What are some of the key industries in that region? But also, what are the key go? What are the key ideas, and what are the key community ideas that are happening in that community? It, it's really important to to understand that. It's important to understand the demographics of the region as well. You know who's in the region, uh, what motivates them, what are their specific areas of giving, what are what are the civic areas of giving, what are the cultural areas of giving. Um, that's that's the most, that's really important in terms of what you need to know in terms of engaging in the US. Also too as well is it's really important to, to get involved in the typical type, the typical area that you're fundraising for too as well. You know, what I found is that if you do a great job of understanding the community, understanding what is important to the community, and if you're able to understand what's important to the community, you understand what's important to the individuals, you can make that connection. Keep in mind that everything you do is all about relationships and all about making those effective relationships. So clearly in working in California, it's a little bit different than working in the Southeast. In the Southeast, it's, it's relationship based. People want to get to know you. They want to get to know who you are. They want to be able to trust you. You're their best friend. They want, it's really a, a relationship that you build with that person. You build that person individually. And this is whether you're dealing with an individual or you're dealing with someone who works as a corporation. They want to know who you are and they want to know what makes you tick. But they want to know how you can impact them and how you think about them and how you think about what they're doing in their lives. In California, it's not to say it's not the same thing, but it's a little bit different. It's it's not necessarily getting to know the individual. It's really getting to know what that what resonates with that person and making sure that you can connect them with what resonates with them. So you have to make sure that when you're in a specific region, when you're working with individuals, you need to know what motivates that particular individual in that region and really what the culture of that region is too as well, because that will determine your success, you know, as a fundraiser. Fundraising in Atlanta is very different than fundraising in California, but you can be successful in both. But the key component is understanding what motivates the individual and understanding how you can help them make an impact. It really is how you can help them make a difference. Super, Jesse, thank you. Liza, um, can you share with us um, an overview on uh, what it's like to raise money in Asia in general and how, um, a, and how a person fundraising in Asia for North America could be the most successful? Sure, I mean, I, I, you know, my, my head was nodding when, when Jesse was speaking. Obviously philanthropy and the way that we raise money, um, it, it's not all that different uh, in Asia. So, you know, we are very um, cognizant of the fact that this is about relationships. So, uh, you know, Jesse said it's all about relationships. I think that's a really important point. Um, it doesn't matter you're, if you're in, in Baltimore or Bombay, right, or Beijing. Uh, this really is about building relationships across culture. So 
um, again, you know, the point that that Jesse made about um, you know culture and what resonates with people, I think, is really essential uh, because as a um, you know a Caucasian working in Asia, uh, I think you you bring different experiences and um, and opportunities uh, that people are keen to to learn about and to understand. So uh, you know, a lot of folks think. <laughs> that uh, fundraising in Asia is very transactional. And I'll tell you, that's not something to be afraid of. So, so many of our relationships start uh, as a transactional thing, right? I, I wanna get a bursary and name it after my father-in-law uh, because it looks good and he's turning 99 and it's gonna be a big thing. Um, that's fantastic, but the way that we see it is that's a, that's a starting point, right? That's the initial conversation for a long-term relationship with the university. Um, and, and we have a lot of gifts that come in from, uh, from friends. So, you know, the, the, the bulk of our, of our uh, uh, funds come from corporate uh, partners and friends. So um, while we have a really great alumni giving program, uh, the bulk of our major gifts come from friends and corporate partners. So really um, taking that transactional relationship and kind of turning that idea on its head, I think is really important when you're dealing in Asia. Um, so, you know, how can a North American fundraiser be successful in Asia? Uh, it takes boots on the ground. So you have to be visible. So, you know, you can't do the, the, the once a year fly in. It's just not going to happen. So really making sure that you take advantage of tools that we have now, uh, like Zoom, uh, to be able to have those relationships um, with your, uh, your donors who live internationally is really, really important. It's something that we have really, um, I'll be honest, struggled with at NTU is trying to figure out how we can use technology um, even to reach, you know, uh, Singapore is a small island. How do we reach folks on the other coast, right? Which is a 45 minute to an hour drive. Um, and we've really narrowed that down to, to have very targeted uh, major donor uh, tea receptions with our deans. Um, and so, you know, we, we have tea sets delivered to our donors and they have uh, an hour long conversation one on one with the dean. So these are opportunities that they may not have had uh, in years. Uh, so, you know, while COVID has brought all kinds of other issues, <laughs> uh, we've been able to turn that transactional um, relationship on its head and really try to create opportunities that broaden the relationship. Um, and it's something that I, I think fundraisers from North America, fundraising in Asia, need to be very um, aware of. And Eliza, do you run into, well, fundraisers, trying to raise money in Asia run into any tax barriers or barriers trying to get the money out of their country into North America? How is that going? Yeah, so uh, this is the biggest question that we get asked actually. So Singapore um, has a very generous uh, tax situation for donations. So um, our donations that we receive in Singapore to the university uh, because we are a, an IPC institution of public character uh, we uh, get a one-to-one -one match from the government for all donations. For donations that come in for undergraduate programs, we get a 1.5 times matching gift from the government. What that turns into for the individual, for the tax resident, is a 250% tax deduction, straight off of your income. So um, when you make a gift to NTU, uh, so you make a $1,000 gift, it's actually worth uh, $2,500 off of your taxable income. It's a lot. So, you know, when, when North American universities come to Singapore, it's a really hard conversation for them to have because if you're not a tax resident in the United States, your money is flowing out of Singapore to a university in the U.S., you're not going to see any tax, deduction, tax relief for that gift. So for those donors who, for whom tax relief is an issue um, and a reason for their giving, uh, it's going to be harder and harder to make that, uh, particularly a $50,000 or $100,000 ask uh, in Singapore. Now, if you're talking to somebody about a million dollar or, or plus gift, uh, I don't think the tax considerations are the reason that they're giving. Um, but money outflow from Singapore is not regulated, uh, unlike China, India, Thailand. Uh, many, many other countries in Asia have a, a very um, structured, and stringent um, regulation on money outflows. So in India, um, we have many donors who want to give to NTU. Uh, they actually have to receive approval from the Central Bank of India. 
uh, to, to, to send out philanthropic gifts. So again, this is designed for Indians to be able to give to, to philanthropic funds in India uh, so that it discourages Indians from giving outside of India. Um, so it's a challenge and you have to, again, the, the story has to resonate to them uh, to be able to get the money for them to be able to go to the central bank and say, hey, I really want to give this gift to XYZ University in the States um, or NTU. Uh, so it's a challenge. Um, trying to pull money out. Um, we've been relatively um, lucky in China. Um, NTU has six offices in China. So we have a corporate partner. Um, NTU has a corporate brand in, in China. Um, so we are actually able to solicit philanthropic funds to support research and student projects in China. But again, the money doesn't flow to Singapore. Um, we've been relatively modestly successful pulling money out of China. Uh, but it equates to about um, half a million dollars a year, uh, Singaporean. Um, so we're not talking millions and millions that's coming out of China. We have been more successful in creating philanthropic opportunities within China. Interesting, interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so let's jump to uh, the COVID question, since that's on everyone's minds. And both of <laughs> Liza, both you and Jesse, your institutions have been massively successful during COVID. Um, talk to us about um, COVID and how it's impacted your local and cross um, and cross border funding. Um, Liza, you can go first if you'd like. Holy smokes! <laughs> uh, COVID in Asia. Um, you know, obviously, we were the first ones to really wake up to the idea that this was a pandemic. Having lived through SARS, having lived through um, other pandemics in Asia. Um, you know, this is, this is an opportunity for us to essentially shine. Um, the challenge is, you know, a SARS virus like COVID uh, kind of sideswiped a lot of the precautions and um, plans that had been in place for other, uh, other similar situations. So um, Singapore uh, went into lockdown in April. Um, we don't call it a lockdown. It was called a circuit breaker, basically just to slow everything down. Um, we, we started working from home <laughs> during the circuit breaker in April. Uh, we are still only 30% back to the office. So it equates to about uh, once a week, we uh, head back to the office and no more than 30% of our staff can be back in the office at a time. Uh, so it's a lot of work uh, to figure out how that actually uh, functions. But like Sean said, we've been very, very uh, uh, prolific during this time at home. So it's, it's given us an opportunity to connect with donors who we might only see once a year. Um, and because they are now attuned to using Zoom or Teams or Skype, um, we've been able to connect with people um, multiple times uh, over the last months when you know, that, that just wasn't feasible when we were doing in-person meetings. So it's really changed the dynamic for a lot of our um, particular major gift officers. So at NTU, I'm lucky, we have a team of about 14 major gift officers who work on uh, gifts of $100,000 and up. So um, we've been very successful in creating um, that relationship. So strengthening that, strengthening that relationship and telling the stories of why our students are even more in need now than they were before. Um, you know, Jesse shared the fact that, that um, you know, 40, 40 some percent of his students are, are Pell Grant eligible almost 50% of our students at NTU receive a form, some form of financial aid. So while our tuition is, is relatively, you know, from US standards, relatively uh, inexpensive, you know, our students come from very, very different um, uh, family situations. And so, you know, being able to make sure that any student who is academically accepted into NTU is able to attend is a huge uh, reason why we do what we do. Um, and the bulk of the funds that we raise are for student support. So. Um, yeah, COVID kind of gave us a, a kind of a kick in the butt and gave us a new uh, funding opportunity for some of our long-term partners. So we were very lucky to go into COVID with about a million dollars in our uh, student emergency fund. Um, what we quickly realized is we needed more. <laughs> so our students, um, you know, as I mentioned, come from very, very different backgrounds. And, you know, being able to afford a $4 bus fare across town from uh, where your parents live is daunting for some students. That means that they're not able to eat that day. Um, so th some of them choose to eat. 
So those are the choices that we were seeing some of our students having to make. Um, and it gave us those, those, those stories that we were able to, to tell our donors. Um, and so we raised over $2 million for the NTU Priorities Fund. So we actually launched the, uh, the fund in April 2020 uh, with a personal gift from our president and his wife, uh, Prof. Subra Suresh, uh, and his wife, Mary. Um, and that really was a, an impetus for so many in the community to kind of wake up to the fact that there was this, this gigantic need. Um, and so we actually meshed it with a grant from the university. So we had two funds. Uh, one was the NTU Priorities Fund and the other was the NTU Fund. And that was set up with um, money from the university to help students uh, be able to afford things like a laptop or a uh, bus fare. So again, this was to help the neediest of the needy um, and really those who didn't receive um, some of the, uh, the financial assistance that the, the Singapore government um, was able to give out. Um, so we were really excited as part of this, the NTU Priorities Fund, you know, one of the things that Prof Suresh really wanted to focus on was the fact that students who received um, a, a financial assistance through the fund had an opportunity or had a idea in their mind that they would pay that money back. So as you know, understanding the culture of philanthropy on campus, you have been helped by a gift of philanthropy. When you're able, when you're in a position to be able to help another student, do so. So it's really allowing us to have that conversation with students while they're still students and while they're not alumni, uh, to really uh, get them to understand that this is you know, something that we're doing as a university community. Um, and, you know, part of that was uh, really reaching out and un making sure that students knew that these funds were available. I think on a lot of our campuses, um, particularly those that are large, students don't always know that these are opportunities are available. So uh, we had pretty good coverage in the national newspapers. We had great coverage online um, and on TV. So this was really a, a good opportunity for NTU to shine uh, because our students are our lifeblood. So again, within six months, uh, within five months, we had already attracted 1,300 donors to the fund. Um, and we actually just recently got a huge gift. So my slides are even outdated from earlier today. So we, we've reached over $2 million uh, for the fund. Um, and again, these are students who have financial need, who've already been screened by the university. Um, and we've been able to reach over 400 uh, with the NTU Priorities Fund. We, the gifts, you know, the, the dollar figures range from $50 to buy rice to upwards of 3,500. So again, based on what the student's need is, we've been able to meet that need. Yeah, so I feel a little funny calling it a scheme, uh, but that's, that's a term in Asia that, that uh, a lot of universities use. So um, obviously because there's no international travel, Singapore is a very small island, nobody was able to leave. So nobody was able to use vacation or holiday leave. So um, what we did as a university community was have a conversation about what we can do with that leave um, because it does have value. So not just the, the mental health of our, of our faculty and staff members, but an actual dollar amount. So what we decided to do is actually um, work together with uh, three or four offices on campus to figure out how we could get um, our faculty and staff an opportunity to donate that leave to an NTU fund of their choice. So what we were able to come up with looking across those offices um, is um, we pegged it at 15 days um, of unutilized leave uh, that they could donate. And then we chose about 48 different funds across the university. So people um, you know, working in the library could donate to the library. So it was a great opportunity for them. So we just launched on October 1st. So we're 15 days in. Um, sorry, this was recorded on October 15th. <laughs> uh, we'll be going through the 31st of October. Um, and then we'll do a second uh, redemption round uh, in 2021 uh, because we know that there are going to be some issues in early next year with using leave as well. So to date, um, we've had 825 staff members donate leave. Uh, the total number of do days donated is 10,000 days. 10,145 days have been donated. This is the most shocking thing to date. Uh, we've raised $5.7 million in leave that has been donated. So 
so again, you know, when you give staff and faculty an opportunity to give something that's personal, your leave days are personal. When you give them an opportunity to donate something um, to the fund of their choice. Um, so we have gifts to every single fund that was available. So we, we had some running bets <laughs> in the office, which were some of the funds that were gonna be the, the biggest, uh, and obviously the NTU Priorities Fund, because that's been circulated for, for weeks now, uh, was the biggest winner um, at around 1.8 million was given directly to the NTU Priorities Fund. And our second bigger, biggest winner was Triple E. So Triple E came in at close to a million as well. So you know we, we have fantastic faculty and staff who recognize where the projects and priorities are that need support. Um, and they came through um, like gangbusters for us for this. So that's what we've been working on for the past few months. Um, and I hope to be able to give a, another update in November. Excellent, Liza, really good. Thank you very much. Jesse, uh, I know COVID 19's had a big impact on some of your fundraising efforts, um, and you've been able to maximize that opportunity. Can you share with us some of your, um, some of the things that you did that are, represent quite a pivot? I can, I can. And also, I just want to mention to Liza, those are amazing efforts, and really, really very important. <laughs> so, you no, know, continue the good work. Um, mm -hmm. I have to have to start by saying that uh, Spelman College is it's it's a private nonprofit institution, and so um, we really do we're we're scrappy, and in terms of fundraising, I mean we really do have to make sure that we uncover every single dollar out there in in the community uh, because we are private and our tuition is is not inexpensive for for our young women, and, and as I mentioned earlier. 48% of our young women re get are, are eligible. I, I do want to start by saying that the the key thing during this time is that as an institution, we all rallied together because we knew that COVID-19 was something that significantly affected the African American community, and it, and so that was one thing that was prevalent um, in terms of everything that we did. Our president showed incredible leadership. Dr. Mary Smith Campbell, and also our board of trustees took a really active role in everything that we've done so far. So we pivoted in March of 2020. In March of 2020, our students did not come back from spring break. They went directly from spring break home. We did not have classes uh, that semester. We do not have classes for the fall semester. So our students are not on campus. But what we did was we took that time to be very deliberate about how we wanted to proceed and how we wanted to make sure that we could provide as much support to our students, but also how we could make sure that Spelman remained stable and remained, you know, certainly as financially strong as possible. So what we did is we looked at our budgets and we made sure that we did some budget tightening. That was the first thing that we did. Also, we know that we have a very challenged uh, student body. We provided tuition discounts to every single student, 10%. We provided a 40% reduction on student fees, every student. Through philanthropy, through fr from some generous supporters, we were able to provide each student with a $3,000 scholarship as well for every single student. Um, that was something that we'd not done ever before. And it was something that we felt that we needed to do at this point in time to make sure that we made it through this period. We worked very closely with our faculty member uh, to make sure that they were safe. We made we worked very closely with our staff to make sure everything was in place so that we could deliver an outstanding education, even though it wouldn't be the same, it would be as outstanding as possible because Spelman is really based on the on-campus experience. The on-campus experience is make, makes Spelman what it is. And so we know that if we didn't create something very similar to that for our students, um, they would be shortchanged. We went to an entirely virtual environment in terms of all of our programming and all of our activities. So we pivoted very, very quickly. And also at this point in time, through advice of our, our consultants, we actually ramped up our fundraising activities. Um, so our fundraising activities now are in overdrive. 
And how we did that is we looked at our annual giving, we looked at our individual giving, we looked at our planned giving, we looked at, at all our corporate and foundation giving, and we looked to see how we could maximize every single component of those, of those areas. And so what we did is we embarked on this really comprehensive focus campaign of engaging our existing donors, but also acquiring new donors to the institution. And, and, it, and it has worked. Uh, what we've, well, we had a, a record fundraising year last year. And the key to our success really has been making sure that we are crystal clear about what impact we're having and what we're doing. Um, at the end of the day, our job is to educate African-American women. And during this period in time, there are a group that are, are really seriously challenged at this point in time. When you look at our students, I mean, they, they may have home challenges, they may have so many different issues. And so we are able to really kind of make the case with the public across the country that it is absolutely essential and important that these young women have access to an education. And just because we're in a COVID pandemic situation, that should not negate the fact that they need to have um, a high quality education. And that message has resonated. We've done that through strategic marketing. We've done that through also utilizing virtual meetings effectively. What we've, what we've done now is we do virtual briefings with small groups of individuals. It was something like, that Liza mentioned, but they're very targeted. They're very targeted in terms of who we bring to the meeting and they're very targeted in terms of the specific initiative that we're talking about as well. And so those have been extremely successful and we've actually deployed those very, very effectively and they've been incredibly helpful to us. Another key element that we have to at Spelman College is we have an outstanding alumni, need to get this alumni because we're women, alumni base that they are deeply committed to the institution. And if you do have individuals who are loyal to our institution, now is the time to rally them, to excite them, to motivate them. They have been incredibly supportive because they know what we need to do. And we have 20,000 alumni, we're, we're small. We have 20,000 alumni. Uh, we have a 33% alumni giving rate. But during this COVID pandemic time, they rallied to our defense uh, in massive numbers. And they have been absolutely essential in our success. Also during this time, we've really leveraged our, our board and also their friendships and their connections that are outside the institution. And so we've actually secured many, many, many new donors who have never given to Spelman before, who have no connection to Spelman, um, and are giving to our institution. So we really kind of created a message in terms of here is how you can be impactful and here is how you can help. We also knew that a lot of our students had need. And so I really want to transition to uh, a slide about our student emergency fund. One of the things that we created during this time that has been incredibly successful for us has been a student emergency fund. And I want to mention this. This is our student emergency fund number one. We currently have a student emergency fund number two that is currently in existence that we're raising money for as well. But I wanted to show this you know, to the group because it's something that we created because we have a, a, a number of students who have tremendous need. And so this, the money raised you see here, the 230,000, it represents a significant commitment from our alumni. Over 80% of the contributors to this fund were alumni. It, it includes significant, you know, six figure gifts too as well, to the fund as well from non-alumni. But what is important with this emergency fund is that we were able to help 293 students. And keep in mind that we only have 2000 students at the Spelman campus. And so we had 409 requests. And so we broke it out in terms of unsupported requests that we were, we 
that did not meet the guidelines of why we created the emergency fund, but were able to help 293 students with technology, if they needed technology, with travel, with rent, and with, with food expenses. And so we were extremely pleased with the impact that this particular fund had. We had no idea that we raised 233,000 and went directly to the students. The new fund that we, emergency fund number two, that we have put in place, our goal is we, we got a $250,000 match and our goal is to raise another $250,000 so to get to, uh, to get to 500 for emergency fund number two. And we're on our way to making that happen. But these type things were important in terms of showing the impact to our donors, to our alumni and to individuals. And this also created a lot of activity and excitement for the institution. What I can say is that it is, is it important at this point in time to really be, be bold in terms of what you want to do. It, it's, I know that a lot of people think that it's COVID-19 and you may want to either pull back or you may just want to continue doing what you're doing from a fundraising perspective. Uh, what we found is that uh, we've been bold and it's really paid off because our donors want to, they're excited about the fact that they're helping and, and their gifts are really making a difference at a time where um, they can really make a difference. And so they've even stepped up to the plate and they've increased their donations. And during this time, you'll find that you'll, you'll find donors who didn't know about your institution, didn't know about your particular cause, and they are willing to step up to the plate and take a chance and really make a difference. But it's really all about making sure that your messaging is clear, that you show impact, and that you then, at the end of the day too, show results and show metrics. You have to be able to show results and show metrics too as well. And that's the approach that, that we've taken. You know, I think it's interesting that both you, Jesse, and Liza talk about results a lot. And I think that uh, people like to make gifts to organizations that are on, that are successful and that are on, that are on a success track. So the, your ability to show your results and tell your story the way you both have with really enormous fundraising success is impressive. But there are a lot of countries in the world right now that are, are not just dealing with the pandemic, but they're dealing with a, what I'm gonna say, a, another layer of, of crisis, whether it's, you know, hurricanes or um, whether it's um, uh, unrest, um, political unrest. Um, in the U.S., um, we've had some political unrest uh, around diversity, inclusion, DEI, and, and it has um, rippled around around the world. In Hong Kong, they started with riots and then they had the pandemic. Here we had the pandemic and, and entered riots. There's other countries that are dealing with massive climate issues. Um, how, how are you managing and have the multiple layers of, of, of political opportunities and, and climatic opportunities impacted your fundraising and um, you know, if you want to go first, Jesse, that'd be great. And then Liza will ask you to comment too. Thanks, Sean. Uh, what you mentioned is, is relevant to what's happening in the U.S. right now. Um, definitely, there are certain issues with racial equity and equal, inequality. And that is something that really kind of comes front and center to an institution like a Spelman or Morehouse, a, certainly a historically black college in, and university. Uh, what we found is there has been an outpouring that we had no idea would happen. Um, we have gotten so much interest from so many individuals and from so many corporations in terms of what can we do? How can we work with you? And what kind of programs can we put in place with your institution so that we can move our company forward in, in a positive, proactive way that is diverse and that is inclusive? 
So for us, it's really been this incredible time where you have all this interest in, in our institution and how we can be a change maker and how we can help their organization grow and move forward and how our students can help their organizations grow and move forward as well. So the whole issue of racial equity has been front and center for us and it's been uh, probably a significant part of our fundraising and our fundraising success over the past few months just because so many uh, organizations are interested in, in working with us. Also too as well, if you look at uh, two of our gifts that we received over the past few months, we received a $40 million gift for scholarship support. And it was directly, it was a part of this whole racial equity nice. issue as well. We received um, a $20 million gift, which was part of this whole racial equity, but making sure that every that we had the funds to do what we needed to do to ensure that our young women would have a unique opportunity. We've gotten multiple gifts from corporations, seven figure gifts from corporations in terms of what can we do to help your students graduate, but what can we do also to really kind of increase the number of African-American women coming to our company, entering the ranks, because we know we have a problem. So what this whole, it, what the, un the uncertainty has done is it's raised the level of conversation where people are having the conversations and are actually taking substantive actions to make change. And we're there to help them make that change. And that, and also that is helping us in philanthropy back to the institution. So for us, we we're saying that it's an opportunity for both us and the organization to move forward in a proactive way. And we're saying that we're trying to create solutions that will help everyone across the board. So for us, the whole racial racial equity issue has been really front and center in our fundraising. And I, and I think it'll be front and center in terms of moving forward in the future too as well, just because there's been so much interest and, and we have just been uh, shocked by, the, by just the amount of interest in terms of what people want to do and how they want change to occur. So you're running them on parallel tracks, COVID yes. and uh, and um, racial equality and inclusion. Excellent, excellent, interesting. Just, just quickly, Sean, I think they're they're inter, um, they're intertwined, and they're they're intertwined because and I think it, because COVID impacts the African American community so much, and racial equity impact impacts the the African American community so much. So in a sense. They're parallel tracks, but they're they're also intertwined, and the effects are intertwined too as well. So um, it's it's kind of a complex situation, but we've been we're managing in terms of how we can do the messaging. Mm -hmm. Yes, interesting. Thanks, Jesse. Liza, how about how about you? In Asia, um, birthplace of some very big demonstrations around um, democracy and equality and. And, and different, of course, in each country, but tell us about um, how political, geopolitical and climatic issues are impacting you and your um, efforts. Sure, I, I, you know, I think like Jesse, we've been really um, lucky to engage people across, um, you know, a, a wide variety of uh, uh, aspirational goals. So, you know, uh, partners, corporate partners who come to us, um, you know, wondering about, um, you know, will my, will my factory in Australia be here in 10 years uh, because of climate change? Um, and NTU is the home of the Earth Observatory of Singapore, which does uh, climate research um, across Asia globally as well. Working with really fantastic researchers and faculty who have, uh, you know, families who are impacted um, across the globe, um, you know, be it riots um, or uh, peaceful demonstrations, uh, you know, from Hong Kong to Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia recently. So we've, we've seen the impact of student activism, uh, which has definitely um, had an impact on campus. Um, I think, you know, our students are very vocal um, and engaged globally, uh, particularly when it comes to things like fossil fuel investments at the, at the corporate level, at the university level. Um, so really, you know, kind of calling us to task about how we are um, uh, investing um, at the university level 
um, our funds. Um, so, you know, it's, it's it's such a wide range of, of topics and, um, uh, and stories that we're able to kind of delve into uh, through our faculty and staff. Uh, I think, you know, unlike um, uh, Jesse, we, we have um, kind of a, uh, a very shifting focus uh, to really look at um, how we can impact Singaporean students. So because we are a national university um, funded by Singaporean taxpayers, uh, but we have, you know, uh, students from 80, 100 different countries on campus, uh, you know, the, the Singaporean taxpayer wants to make sure that, that Singaporean students are well looked after. Um, and so, you know, the, the focus has to always be on our Singaporean identity while we live and work in this global environment. Um, so, you know, trying to uh, figure out how we can have those discussions with students about student activism uh, across Asia Pacific, uh, I think is one that we um, are, are continually challenged with. Uh, and, you know, recently we had students come to us uh, exactly with this fossil fuel investment. Uh, so, you know, these are, these are topics and, uh, um, you know, opportunities, quite honestly, uh, for engagement with students, uh, because we want them to see us as proactive um, and as part of a team. So, you know, Sean, you mentioned this, this earlier is, you know, everybody wants to be on the winning team, right? And so, when we can engage with students and make sure that they understand that we're all part of the same team and we all want to be on the winning team, um, I think it really gives them a different perception of what the uh, the challenges and opportunities are that we can kind of craft together. Interesting. Thank you, Liza. So, if there was if there was one thing, Liza, that you were going to um, tell fundraisers about fundraising in Asia for North America, what would that be? Wow, uh, one thing. One thing, uh, <laughs> one, the one most important thing. 10 things is easy. One thing is really hard. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think being culturally relevant. So re you really understanding where you're walking into a conversation with a donor um, and, and what their expectations are. So, you know, we, we talk at NTU about aspirational giving. Um, that's huge for me. So, you know, whether or not I'm talking to a donor in New York or or nothing, right? I really want to talk to them about how we can have that, uh, how they can help us with that aspirational um, uh, goal. Uh, so I think, you know, that's not something that's particularly different here in Asia, but where you meet the donor is important. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't mean physically, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I mean really culturally. So, you know, understanding some of those cultural clues are really important. Uh, and there are a lot of guides out there, and there are a lot of folks like Sean and I who can answer these questions for you if you're going into a conversation with, you know, a big family foundation or, or uh, an alum that you haven't really been in contact with. Uh, but really making sure that you meet them where they are. I think, you know, all of us have these preconceived ideas of, uh, of somebody who's been working or living in Asia for a long time. Um, and we really need to check some of those, those uh, preconceived ideas at the door. Um, and really meet people where they are and have those relationships uh, founded on, on trust and being real. Um, our donors in Asia, they know when you're being phony. So I would, I would really make sure that people be their true authentic self um, and, and come to Asia um, understanding that people are people, um, but people expect um, you to be true and real and tell them the real story. So Liza, do you feel if you were a, a new fundraiser, uh, if you were assigned recently to raising money in Asia for your North American institution, um, do you, I, I can envision um, a scenario where uh, a person with this new international responsibility would get a book and read some things online and kind of cover the stereotypes. Um, and then when they get there, so you're saying don't fake it until you make it. You're saying, yeah. you know, be honest, ask the prospects about, yeah. about their culture Absolutely. and about, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, that was one of the, the best experiences that I had uh, coming to Asia. I mean, I had traveled to Asia quite extensively, but living here was one, uh, something different. So, you know, uh, understanding what, um, uh, what food preferences your donor has, you know, and, and they may take you to a place that you've never been before. Uh, you might eat food that you've never had before. 
ask them, what is this? You know, be excited and, and enthusiastic about their culture. I think it definitely gives you an opportunity to be authentic in the relationship. Uh, because if you're not, they can tell. <laughs> and we want, to, we, want to, we want to be true uh, to our own mm -hmm. selves and to our own, you know, ethical responsibilities as, as fundraisers. But really starting off the relationship um, as, as a true relationship. So there, you know, there are a lot of dating parallels, right? But we really want to make sure that we're authentic and that we're, we're truthful. So if you've never had bakute before, don't pretend you have. <laughs> Just eat it and say, my God, this is the best thing I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> and yeah, so, so that would be my advice. Is you can read all you want, but until you're actually here, until you're face-to-face -face over a, a lunch or a dinner or over a tea service, you're not going to know what that experience is like. Um, and be enthusiastic. So, so don't shut yourself off from having those kind of opportunities with donors. Thank you. Um, Jesse, uh, if you were to give one piece of advice um, to a person in, um, who's not from North America to raise money in North America, what would it be? The one piece of advice. One piece, not multiple, just one. <laughs> just one. <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I actually think what Liza mentioned in terms of being authentic, I think that's incredibly important because people know when you're not being authentic and they're not going to give to someone that they feel that they can't trust and is not authentic. Um, but there, there are two that I'd like to mention that I think are important, whether, whether you're uh, fundraising uh, in in the U.S. or I even think fundraising, you know, uh, in internationally, and I think it's definitely important to be consistent. You know, it's important to make sure that you are getting back with the, with the individual and you're you're touching base with them periodically. That you just don't talk with them once and then they they don't hear from you. But that consistent, meaningful engagement not to talk just because you feel it's been three months, I got to talk with this individual. It really is finding meaningful ways to keep that person engaged and being real, being authentic and, and actually being genuine, you know, in that conversation. But I think consistency is very, very important. The other thing too, uh, for me is I think listening is absolutely essential. Listening to who they are, listening to, uh, what's happening with their family, listening to um, what, what's on their mind, what their concerns are, you know, about, uh, you know, the economy and just being a good listener and being able to, to have that conversation and just listen to what they have to say. So from my perspective, in addition to being authentic, I do think it's important to be consistent and make sure that you follow through on what you're going to do and, and what they ask you to do. But then, and also showing them that you've, you're showing them the, the outcomes too as well. Um, and then coupling that with, with great listening. And I think uh, that you'll be successful, you know, certainly mm -hmm. in, in North America, whether you're mm -hmm. doing fundraising in Arizona or California or Atlanta, uh, uh, you'll be successful. Excellent, excellent. Well, we've had um, uh, an important conversation today. And I know that I've learned a few things, but all good news stories and panel stories um, end with what is your last word? <laughs> so I'm going to give you each an opportunity to have one last word um, to, our, to our conference participants. And I know they look forward to meeting you in the question and answer session that we'll be having later. So Jesse, what's your one last word? Uh, my one last word would be to be bold. Uh, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Be bold and, and go for it. That would be, that's more than one word, but be bold. That's what I would be say. Be bold is brilliant. Thanks so much, Jesse. Liza, what is your one last word? So, so this was a, some advice that I actually uh, got from a colleague um, about 10 years ago. And, you know, Jesse and I have both been in this business for, for, for two decades and probably will be in this business for another two decades. And I've had the opportunity to, to travel many countries. And I would just tell you, make sure that you have, your family understands what you do. Uh, my daughter to this day just says that I plan parties and I ask people for money. Pretty cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> make sure your family knows what you would do and the impact it has on your community. 
Um, and then make sure that you're able to, tech that, to take that next job. So make sure that you're financially able to leave California for Atlanta. So make sure that you're able to leave DC for Mumbai. So make sure that you're able to structure your life so that you're able to take advantage of that next opportunity because you never know where in the world it's gonna be. So make sure that you, um, you structure your career so they're able to take that next leap. So be bold, but make sure you prepare. Be bold and ready. <laughs> be bold and ready. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We truly appreciate it. I'm Sean O'Hara, a consultant with O'Hara Management Consultants and professor at Cal Lutheran University. We appreciate you taking the time to join IFAB online and fundraising in Asia for North America. Have a good day and take care.